Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Our speaker this evening received a Ph.D. in philosophy from the Catholic University of America in 1997. Dr. John Cutterback writes and lectures on various topics including virtue, household and family life, natural law, contemplation, and friendship. A third order lay Dominican, he currently teaches in the philosophy department at Christendom College. His book, True Friendship, Where Virtue Becomes Happiness, was published in 2010. Dr. Cutterback also writes for his blog titled Bacon from Acorns, where he provides a weekly Wednesday quote and reflection on some aspect of the good life. Dr. Cutterback is an avid gardener and a hunter, is happy to make a household with his wife and children in the Shenandoah Valley. He is a frequent speaker for the ICC as well as one of our Magdala Apostolate professors. Please join me in welcoming back Dr. John Cutterback. Thank you very much. When Father Hezekiah asked me to, to speak on the art of dying, I had to chuckle to myself. I wasn't exactly sure what um, inspired him to, to ask me, but I won't, I won't think about that too long. But I, I have to say it's, it's been uh, very enriching for me to, to spend some time preparing for this, and I'm uh, looking forward to sharing it with you. I'm going to read you first uh, the quotation. It's the first quotation on your handout that was the basis for Father Hezekiah's inspiration uh, for this title and topic, The Art of Dying, Living in Conversation with the Lord. And you'll see why from these words of Pope Emeritus Benedict, interestingly, exactly one year ago today, um, at the funeral of Cardinal Meissner, who had been the cardinal in Cologne, Germany. So he would have been a kind of colleague and friend of the Pope Emeritus. These were Pope Benedict's words. When on the last morning, Cardinal Meissner did not appear for Mass, he was found dead in his room. The bravery had slipped from his hands. He died while praying, his face on the Lord, in conversation with the Lord. The art of dying which as given to him, again demonstrated how he had lived, with his face towards the Lord and in conversation with him. So we may confidently entrust his soul to the goodness of God. Lord, we thank you for the witness of this, your servant, Joachim. Let him now intercede for the Church of Cologne and for the whole world. May he rest in peace. So it's, it's Benedict's, Pope Benedict, who has sounded this theme for us of the art of dying. Isn't it, isn't it a, a, a beautiful notion? Living in conversation with the Lord. We'll come back to the notion of living in conversation with the, with the Lord, but I want to begin by saying, for Christians, it's always all about life. If we're interested in death, we're interested in death because we're interested in life. If we need to understand death, and we do, it's because we need to understand life. If we need to learn how to die well, as we do, it's because we need to learn how to live well. Our culture, at times, can be obsessed with death, there's different reasons for thinking about death. Some think about death because they've more or less given up on life. Christians think about death because we have so much to live for. Not so little to live for. So much to live for. 
And this is why death is such an incredibly important topic for us. You know, young people probably don't think much in terms of death or the art of dying. The art of dying surely is something that anyone, once he's an adult in any case, should be thinking in terms of cultivating. It's interesting how the young in general don't think about death, though I'm going to tell you a quick story, and it will kind of have greater meaning a little bit later in view of a couple other things we look at. But um, I'm blessed with six children. My youngest, Raphael, he's now six. He was seven years behind the child that's above him. He knew my father for the first year and 11 months of his life. So my father passed away before the second birthday of Raphael. We had the blessing to be able to do a wake for my father in a shed, in a barn that he had built. And a couple of years later, we were, as a family, we'd been down at Dad's old pond, and we were going through the, the barn, and Raphael stopped as now about a four-year-old, and he, and he looked exactly where Dad's coffin had been, and he said, that's where Grandpa was sleeping. Later on, I had a very interesting situation. Fast forward another year or so, Raphael was about five. And I had the opportunity to be reading Bible stories with him. And we read about Jacob's Ladder. And for some reason, Jacob's Ladder just, just really caught Raphael's imagination. And he kept saying to me, I want to see Jacob's Ladder. Can I please see Jacob's Ladder? Where is it? It became kind of difficult because, you know, how sometimes a child almost gets irrationally upset, and he, w- he was getting upset. And I said, I said, Raphael, I'm sorry, I, I can't show you Jacob's ladder. Now we can say that our Lord is, is Jacob's ladder. In a sense, he's, he's our way to heaven, but um, you can't really see Jacob's ladder. I, as he was going to bed that night, I said, Raphael, I have something very important that I want to tell you as a follow-up to our conversation. And I looked at his eyes, I said, I want you to try to remember this. Many of the most important things in life are things you cannot see with your eyes. And he looked at me and he said, you mean like grandpa whom we buried in the grounds and now we can't see him? I said, yes, Raphael. That's exactly what I mean. You can't see Grandpa, can you? But he's one of the most important things in our life. You never know how death is at work in astoundingly important ways, even for the young. I want to talk about the art of dying. There's, there's far too much to say about this topic, and so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to, to focus on, but I just want to close that, by the way, by saying, isn't, isn't God's plan just astounding? And in so many ways, we keep coming upon such wonderful things, such as the role of grandparents. I'm so grateful that that son at least had just under two years of his grandpa, and I know he'll never forget it. And I, and I say to you, to you grandparents, you never know, you might be the icon of a good death for maybe not a large number of people, but even if just for one, what an incredible gift that could be. Thank you, Jesus, for grandparents. What is an art? We're going to talk about the art of dying. So what's an art? An art is an an habitual know-how wherein determinate means are taken to achieve a determinate end. It's an habitual know-how wherein determinate means are taken to achieve some determinate end. So if we want to talk about any art, we are talking about something that needs to be learned something that is a knowledge and a practice, wherein there are certain set 
good ways of doing things in order to achieve some specific end. Any art, you could say that about. So the art of dying, I've already asserted to you, and I assert again, is fundamentally about the art of living. The art of dying is, I suggest, the art of living well up to and into and through your death. The art of dying is nothing else, I think, than the art of living well all the way up to and into and through your death. If then that's what the art is about, then it, its end is living well. What we, can, we never should cease to go back to basic things and ask ourselves again, what is living well? You can consider living well from various angles, but I'll sound a note that you've heard sounded here often at the ICC before. It's about living virtuously. Living well is living virtuously. Great insight that goes back to the Greeks and is continu- continued by the Christians. But I, I dare say, if we're thinking about the art of dying, what angle might we want to take as regards thinking in terms of virtue? It's the art of living well. It's the art of living virtuously, particularly as regards having the right order of desires, of valuing what is most important well, in view of death, it's keeping things in their right order. This is what living virtuously is. But it's, death allows us to kind of focus in on that. One of my favorite lines and in insights from Socrates is, do you live your life as though what is most important is most important? Or do you treat less important things as though they were more important? I'll, I'll never tire of, of, of citing Socrates on that. Is, is there any greater, better line that we could bring to our attention and reflect upon? This is the way it always is with the wise. They're able to capture the fundamental things in very simple statements, the type of statement that you come back to again and again and again. When you first hear it, you think, oh, that makes a lot of sense. But then you have to keep coming back to it. Do we live as though what is most important is most important? Or do we live as though things that are less important are more important? How's that for the art of living well? And the art of dying well as particularly bringing that into focus. What is most important after all? We'll have a moment to say a little bit more about that as we proceed. Another, another word about in art before we go further. In art is something that can be studied and something that can be practiced. This evening, we are studying it. You can't so much say that we are, stu- we are practicing the art of dying well, but tonight, we're studying together. And it's very important, study has a very critical place in building our knowledge. Now, if we just study it tonight and come to understand certain great things, we all know that will only get us so far. This art is not an art that's simply about knowing something. It is an art that's ultimately about doing something. And so we're going to have to practice it. But as an art, it is something that can be studied, and that's why we're doing it. And we're beginning by even reminding ourselves what an art is. And in this case, particularly, what its end is. Any art is always a very teleological reality. Teleology is a, is a fancy word that comes from the Greek word telos, which means end. End or goal. Not end in the sense of just stopping place. End in the sense of goal and completion. When I say any art is teleological, what we mean is it's focused on the goal, which is exactly the way that life should be. So it's nice that, in a sense, the art of dying, of which we are speaking, is the art of living. And we're going to have to very much then keep our eyes on the end and then think as clearly as we can about how to achieve it. So my plan then is to enumerate three determinate means. Remember I said that an art takes certain determinate means to achieve the end. So my plan is to focus on three determinate means that we can think about as being good means for developing this art, for achieving the end 
of living well up to and into and through our death. I'm going to suggest three means that this art would take. And likewise, you could say then three things we would do to develop this art. And those three things are this. Remember your own death and prepare for it. Remember the dead and remember your end in the sense of that richer sense, telos, what your life is about anyway. So remember your own death and prepare for it. One, two, remember the dead. Three, remember your end. It, it's interesting, to, isn't it, to say, remember your death. Rem- how can you remember your death? We, 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 we don't know. We haven't experienced our death, have we? It, it, it's hard to prepare for something that you don't know what it is. How are we to do that? Well, I, I have two suggestions, and here are those two suggestions that come under remembering your own death. By living through the death of those we love and by suffering. And I think these are two ways that our Lord gives us to remember our own death and to prepare for our own death. Again, the first is by living through the death of those we love, and the second is by suffering, and I'll consider each briefly. Uh, take a peek, if you would. Wait, you don't, again, you don't have to. I'd like you to have the handout as a reference. I'm going to give you a couple quotations from Joseph Pieper, one of my fa- favorite 20th century philosophers, German. So this is after the quotations I'm not reading you out loud from from Seneca and Epictetus. So in the middle of the first page, more likely than not, this is Joseph Pieper, more likely than not, therefore, a challenge is required that shakes the common and normal attitudes dominating by nature and by right man's everyday life. A push is needed, a shock, in order to trigger the question that reaches beyond the sphere of mere material needs. The question as to the meaning of the world and of existence to trigger the philosophical process. A shock of this kind is the confrontation with death. Now, here's the thing. In general, when do we confront death? It, 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 it's possible to have to confront it when one finds out, for instance, that one has a terminal illness. But in general, he's saying one of the main ways that we are brought to consider the meaning of life and many of the most important things that we need to consider is by the death, having to reckon with the death of somebody that we love. So I'd like to just pause for a moment and reflect with you on what an incredibly important part of our life it is that we try to live well in the dying, in and through the dying of those usually that are closest to us. Pieper gives another quotation that particularly struck me, and I gave it right after, on the handout right after the one that I just read out loud. It's a quotation from Gabriel Marcel, a French philosopher, also the 20th century. To love a being is to say, thou shalt not die. To love a being is to say, thou shalt not die. Isn't it interesting? I find there's something very beautiful herein. The the way, what that means to me is, in a sense, it's not that you live in denial. We know there's death, but it's so often in the most important realities, there's death, and then there's death. We have to reckon with, yes, our loved ones die, but to human persons ever really die. And when you really love somebody, it, it brings out this beautiful reality of, in a sense, not being willing to accept the death of that person. I have to take that in the right sense. And so we have to be so careful how we use our words. You have to be able to accept it. But in a sense, I think this is, I think this is the truth that people are going after. In a sense, when you really love somebody, you, are, you have the insight and you have the will that 
This, the world cannot exist, in a sense, without this person. In a sense, how could I go on without this person? I will that this person not die. Isn't it interesting, then, I think it's, it's fitting that we have that sense when we love and we love well, in a sense, that is an avenue for this astounding insight. I'm not going to say it gives a proof, but I think it does give an insight into the deeper and higher calling of human beings. It does not make sense. I think there's a very deep intuition here. The world could not be without this person. We must be immortal. There must be something more to human life. I'm convinced that God gives us the opportunity to have that insight by our having to deal with and to do our best to do, deal well with the death of a loved one. I'll read you the one more quotation, Joseph Pieper. To hold aloof from death is to cheat oneself of the profoundest insight into one's own personality. To hold aloof from death is to cheat oneself of the profoundest insight into one's own personality. Somehow, in death, we have a deep insight into who we are and the higher things that we are made for. And to run from it is to run from our own identity. So here what I'm suggesting is, first of all, we are given the opportunity to start to reckon with our own mortality and what we are called for on the other side of our mortality, precisely by being given the opportunity to have to reckon with the death of those that we love. So we begin to cultivate the art of dying well by reckoning well with living through to its fullest. We'll have another word about that, the death of those that we love. I'm going to go on then to the second point that um, comes under this first point, and that is by learning to suffer well. In other words, the second way that we can, God has given us to prepare for our own death not just by having to endure well the death of those that we love, but also by suffering. And here I raise a very deep topic that we're not going to be able to do justice to, and to some extent I apologize, but I want to be able to draw a couple of connections. Isn't all of suffering, and this is a very St. Augustine kind of point, isn't all of suffering, in a sense, a mini-death? Anytime we're suffering, we're experiencing something as contrary to our will or as contrary to our nature. In that way, it is very much like death. Death is, in a sense, contrary to our will. In a sense, it is contrary to our nature. Indeed, ultimately, God did not make us, did not intend that we die. There is something, in an important sense, unnatural about death. All of suffering, then, is a kind of mini-taste and begins to give us practice for our own death. Here's a fascinating aspect where we might ask this question. But how, how can good come of suffering? How can good come of death? Aren't these ultimately, in Christian theology, a punishment And isn't a punishment for sin simply something to be endured? I think herein we have one of the most beautiful points of our evening. A key principle is at work here. With God, and hopefully also with with all those who participate in his authority and have to at some point punish people, with God, the punishment is always also a remedy. With God, when he punishes, he punishes in love. And the very punishment itself 
is always unto the life, the healing, the salvation of those that are punished. It's an excellent opportunity here, and, and this is, the again, this will be a, a far too short and brief, inadequate treatment of suffering. But this part I'd really like to emphasize because I think that it helps us connect well with death. What an incredible opportunity it is to trust in divine providence. You know what Boethius said? Boethius said, trust in the divine providence is always what sets Christians apart. It's the Christian especially who can look at anything that happens. This is really an astounding assertion. Can look at anything that happens and with confidence say, this is under a loving and merciful plan. It's an astounding assertion about reality to be able to say that, to have that kind of trust in divine providence. Isn't this a great opportunity to see that? Even the way that God punishes us for our sin is itself a gift. The death that we wouldn't be talking about right now, had there not been sin, there would be no art of dying, for there would have been no death. But this incredibly beautiful thing that we can talk about, it brings to mind the O Felix Culpa, O Happy Fall, that actually through our sin, God has this amazing opportunity to show in this superabundant way his loving plan for us. And that even then our suffering, every time we are suffering, it is an opportunity for us to, first of all, trust in a divine providence and say, Lord, I don't see why necessarily, but I trust. I've just been reading the 18th chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke recently, and it's, 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 it's at the point um, where he tells the story of the unjust judge who the widow keeps pestering, and so the judge does what the widow asks them. And our Lord says, and, and will not God always answer the prayers of his people? And right after that, right after having said that, he said, but when the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on earth? Right after having said this, will not your Father in heaven always answer your prayer? And he says, but when the, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? And it just brought to my mind this astounding drama. God is so ultimately trustworthy, so showing this to us, that he always has our good in mind in everything that happens. But will he find faith? Isn't this the great drama? Are we willing to trust God? Are we willing to trust God in the face of death? Are we willing to trust God in the face of suffering? It brings to mind... I remember well trying to teach my daughter how to swim. Perhaps you all have, or how to act in the water. Perhaps you've experienced this as parents. And and you're trying to get the child just to to relax. And and you you keep saying, dear, I've got you. I am right here. And and, and the child, you know, there's just something, the child just can't let go. At least without more experience. And it just, it, the, the image of, of, of our dear Father, again and again, I've got you. I have got you. Can you not see that? Isn't it great to be parents and have that opportunity to, to make that comparison? You're just thinking, what do I have to do to get my child to see? What does God have to do to get us to see that our suffering is a gift to turn our heart to what is most important? This, I suggest to you, is the ultimate meaning of suffering. Every time we are suffering, it is an opportunity to reform our desires, to reform our heart, to learn what is most important or not. And I challenge you, I know it's so easy for me to stand up here and say this. So many people suffer so much more than we'll ever know. But I challenge each of us, any suffering is always a call to 
learn to put first things first and to grow in that virtue that is the living well of loving well and loving what is most important, first of all. The second practice, determinant means for developing this art, and each of these other two will be a little shorter than that first one. The second is remember the dead. I don't have a lot to say about remembering the dead. When after I say this second point and the third, then I'm just going to wrap up by making a couple of practical suggestions about each of these three areas. And so I'll have a practical suggestion to make about remembering the dead. But this is one thing. It's interesting. Christians excel at it. Not only Christians. There's something deep in, that God has written into human nature. For you see pagan cultures that do this too. We, we bury the dead and we bury them well. And then we live in their presence. We live in memory of them. Is this not a key way that we prepare for our own death? We live, not in a morbid way, but an appropriate way. We live in the memory, which means, to, because memory is this incredible gift that makes things present. Always remember that about memory. Memory can make present something that otherwise wouldn't be present. It's interesting, again, we say living in memory of our death, something present that's not quite present. Live in the memory of the dead who are still present. How do we live in the memory of them? Very quickly, two, two things. We pray for them. There is such a long and beautiful tradition of this. Is, is this, not, this is part of the art. Part of the art of dying well is to be the kind of person that is thinking of the dead consistently. My, my, my wife, uh, one, of her, one of her grandmothers, just it was her thing to remember the souls in purgatory. And I've always remembered that. It always just seems so beautiful. Is, is this not an incredible practice? Just to live in the presence of nice souls in purgatory in general. But what about, again, our own ancestors, our own loved ones? To live in their presence is an act of charity. It's an act of solidarity with them. Not just praying for them, though. Literally thinking about them. And I I might put it this way. I think there is a way of remaining overly detached, pardon me, overly attached to those who are gone. And we are more thinking about ourselves. We're more thinking about how hard our life is without that person. I don't want to make it. Dis- I don't want to be too harsh in criticizing that, for it's very understandable. But may I make a quick distinction? Living in the memory could could be a kind of feeling sorry for ourselves. I like to distinguish that from living in the memory in the sense of living in gratitude, living in gratitude for everything we had with them, rather than focusing on what we don't have which would be a kind of exercise in self-pity. I think we have to be careful about that, and we can help one another in this. Proper grieving can help us let go in the appropriate sense and hold on in the appropriate sense. Hold on in the sense of remembering gratefully, living in the presence of, but not in a self-pitying self-centered way, more actually looking towards them and their flourishing and their happiness. I turn now to the third determinant means that I want to talk about cultivating. The second, again, having been remembering the dead. And this last is remembering your end. Here, I go back to what Pope Emeritus Benedict said about Cardinal Meissner. Remember he said that Cardinal Meissner lived in conversation, and that is why he died well. Well, I'd like to suggest here the key. I think this is the key to the whole thing, drawing out that wisdom of Pope Emeritus Benedict. 
the central point, the central insight into what our life is for and what living well is and thus what preparing for death and dying well is. And here I turn to St. Thomas to help me make this point. At one point, St. Thomas gives a, a statement about the interior life. He says of the interior life that it is a conversation with God and with the angels. St. Thomas, interior life, a conversation with God and with the angels. And we just focus for a moment on this, on this term. I think the term interior life can lose its meaning for us. When we think of interior life, we think of, well, oh, isn't that's the kind of thing that you work on every now and then well, you have, you know, when you're practicing praying, or that's what people live in their religious life work on. They work on their interior life. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to suggest to you is, in a sense, our interior life is who we are. Our interior life is the epicenter of our life. What kind of interior life do we have? With whom are we in conversation? And about what? I present for your consideration that is perhaps the most significant question one could ask about your own life. What is the quality of my interior life? Is this not most fundamentally who I am? If we, like Cardinal Meissner, are living in conversation with the Lord, in Pope Benedict's words, Living, living, in conversation with the Lord. I give you that phrase right there is a fabulous way of capturing human life at its height. And thus, how do we cultivate the art of dying well? What, what, was, what, was, what was Pope Benedict so joyfully reflecting on? That bravery dropping from the hands of a man as the life left his body. He died as he had lived in conversation with the Lord. I like to emphasize friendship as a great theme to help us understand life. And one of my favorite points about conversation, as Aristotle made and St. Thomas loves to draw out, is that the heart of friendship is conversation. When are friends most alive? Friends are most alive in conversation. So from that angle too then, again I say, with whom are our conversations and what, about what are we speaking? This is is the central question of our life and whether we are preparing well to die. I'm going to do something a little bit offbeat. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a quotation right now from an author that I like. I, I'm going to give just a, a little caveat. He's not a religious writer. Wendell Berry, Kentuckian, farmer, thinker, essayist, as well as fiction writer. Jaber Crow, a complex book. I find it a deeply and profoundly beautiful book. And I'm going to get, I put two quotations on here. I'm at least going to, going to read one of these out loud to you. And it will convey something that I wanted to convey. But you could not be where I, he was a barber. I'm not going to, he's a barber and he talks about his life is seen through people coming into his barbershop. You could not be where I was without experiencing many such transformations. One of your customers, one of your neighbors, let us say, is a man known to be more or less of a fool, a big talker. One day he comes into your shop and you have heard and you can see in his eyes that whether or not he admits it, he knows it. 
and all of a sudden everything has changed. You seem no longer to be standing together in the center of time. Now you are on time's edge, looking off into eternity. And this man, your foolish neighbor, your friend and brother, has shed somehow the laughter that has followed him through the world and has assumed the dignity and the strangeness of a traveler departing forever. You wonder why I gave that quotation to you right now. I remember a few years ago we were at the beach as a family and my father already had growing dementia at the time. I read that out loud. I was reading, because I was reading Jay Crow at the time, and I read that out loud. And my brother came to me afterwards privately, and he said, you know, those beautiful words make me think of Dad. Someone who is starting to approach death takes on a kind of new character. They're, they're, somehow, they're somehow different. They somehow put you in a, in a new perspective. It's as though one foot is already crossing over the other side, but only one foot. One is still with you. The conversations of such a person tend to start to be different. And I suggest what an incredible gift it is that that is so. Perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, some of us in, that, in this room are that person. Or for I think for any of us in this room, we know someone who is that person. Who, as it were, already has started that journey across, is a kind of pilgrim who already has in his eyes, in, in what he's talking about, a, a something of the greater. Why did I say that right here? Because I think there's something beautiful about how that gives a different focus to our conversations. What do we talk about? And with whom do we talk about it? Ladies and gentlemen, what an incredible treasure we have and so many myths in the elderly, so many of whom would just love to have someone to talk with. The things that they would speak of and the different perspective on life it would give to the people who took the time to speak with them. What is life about anyway? With whom are we speaking? And about what are we speaking? I just, I I go there to, in thinking about our life as most of all lived in conversation. Those that are approaching death, whether it be us or those around us, give us an opportunity in developing this art to refocus and to change and to elevate what we spend our time talking about. I have a few practical suggestions that I'll quickly just match up to each of those three areas. Remember the three were remember your own death, remember the dead, second, and then remember your end in the sense of the great fulfillment of our life, especially in conversation. Remembering our own death. A couple of just Suggestions I want to throw out there without, without being morbid, I, I think a beautiful way to exercise our remembering our own death is to actually say to ourselves something like, what would I say to those around me if I knew that I weren't going to have an opportunity to speak to them again? Might this be a good opportunity for all of us just to remind ourselves there are people that need to hear certain things from us, whether it's an apology, whether it's a thank you, whether it's a, gosh, it's been good living with you, that we need to say, we might never get a chance to say, 
if we don't remember our own death and plan ahead. Another way to remember our own death is to practice suffering well as a preparation for death. And, and what do I mean by practicing suffering well? Here's my simple suggestion. I know it sounds so simple to say it, but I'm just going to toss it out in, in any case. When we're suffering, when we're facing a challenge, put it in view of death. You know, I, I was at a, a World Cup watching party today, and, and, and we were seriously pro-Croatia. <laughs> All right. And, and it, was, it, was, it was painful. I mean, like one of my ch- children was crying. I, you know, the, the faces of those Croats, I just thought, were so, were so rich. And, kind of, and, 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 and you know, I, I don't know, I, just, I felt like I felt the suffering of their people back there. But in any case, and then I, I just thought, you know, at the final judgment... God bless these soccer players. They're not going to give a hoot <laughs> whether they won this game today. You just, just put it, put it, put it in, 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 in view of eternity. You know, all, all the little things that frustrate us. It's, it, it's a gift that we've been getting, given. Think in terms of our death. And, and that gives us an extra insight. All right, a couple of suggestions about remembering the dead. Think carefully about how you bury your loved ones. Be physical. Be real. Be together. I, I, I love the topic. I'm not going to say anything more right now than to, than to just suggest we can do burial better than we do. And I think we should. It's important, especially for us. I had the blessing to be able to bury my father in the ground with shovels. I wrote, I wrote a piece on it, and I, I try to express therein the incredible gifts that came to us as a family and to many others by working with the soil and doing the hard work and doing the painful work of it. It was a blessing for us, and just, I just share that with you. That's something that's in our control, and it's Christian, and it's right. I'm not saying this to make anyone feel guilty about, about sometimes certain things can't be done. We just do what we can do. Consider bearing the dead well as an act of mercy, especially towards ourselves and towards the others that are burying. Remembering your end. Here, fundamental suggestion, think interior life. I hope we might leave our reflection on the art of dying together by thinking more about how central to our life and thus our death, is our interior life. Are we living in conversation? Are we doing those practices our spiritual directors try to remind us of? Are we set aside, setting aside the time of the day? Are we practicing Lexio Divina? These are things, there's an art of these things, and it's in our hands. No one's going to do it for us. Are we cultivating an interior life? Do we have the habits such that we'll die like Cardinal Meissner did. I'd like to end, if I might, with just a quick word about St. Joseph, patron of departing souls. Uh, A couple of years ago, I I gave a lecture um, for the ICC, and I gave a reflection that's similar to this, and I hope you'll forgive me for very briefly doing so again in conclusion here this evening. St. Joseph is the patron of, of departing souls, and that's traditionally, of course, because... He died, we hold by tradition, in the arms of the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. I'd just like to give a slightly different angle. Uh, pardon me, what did I just say? That St. Joseph died in the arms of our Lord and of the Blessed Mother. But here's a slightly different angle, if you'll just join me in a very quick, very quick reflection. I like to think of the following happening. I stand in the correction of the church if there's anything in, inappropriate about this, but I, I, I don't think that there is. Isn't it remarkable to think of how much time our Lord and St. Joseph spent together? Our Lord spent more time with St. Joseph by far, 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 far than any other human being, obviously other than the Blessed Mother. And I like to think of the one day they were going about their business in the shop, and they took a little break together, and then our Lord was back, and our Lord was starting to work again, and St. Joseph hadn't come back. 
And our Lord immediately noticed that it was a little bit different because they had their habits that they were so used to together. And, of course, our Lord was super sensitive, and they completely felt one another, I am sure, in all things. And so our Lord immediately knew that there was something a little bit different, and so he went looking for St. Joseph. And he found St. Joseph in another room. And And I picture St. Joseph in that other room, and he was weeping. And I picture our Lord coming up to him, and our Lord immediately knowing why St. Joseph was weeping. And as they wept together, I picture St. Joseph looking into his boy's eyes and saying, You know, son, I just really wish that I was going to be there with you. And as St. Joseph is weeping, and as his son is weeping, picture our Lord saying, Daddy, you taught me how to walk. You taught me how to talk. You taught me how to work. We have worked together most every day that I've been on this earth. The conversations we have had are part of who I am. If you think there's ever any place I'll be or anything I'll undergo where you, Daddy, won't be with me, you are wrong. And I'm absolutely convinced that our Lord went back in his mind to conversations that he had over a plane in a lathe while he was hanging on the cross. St. Joseph lived in conversation with Jesus. St. Joseph died in conversation with Jesus. And you know what? Our Lord lived in conversation with St. Joseph. And our Lord died, I'm certain of it, in conversation with St. Joseph. May we, like St. Joseph, live and die in that conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. There's uh, two thoughts stuck in my mind, both relating to that first point that you're saying. There's three points, right? And the first being for us to remember our own death. There's a uh, excerpt in the Catechism. This is uh, 1014, and it's an excerpt from St. Francis of Assisi's Canticle of the creatures, and it reads as follows. Every action of yours, every thought, should be those of one who expects to die before the day is out. Death would have no great terrors for you if you had a quiet conscience. Then why not keep clear of sin instead of running away from death? If you aren't fit to face death today, It's very unlikely you will be tomorrow. Praised are you, my Lord, for our sister bodily death, from whom no living man can escape. Woe on those who will die in mortal sin. Blessed are they who will be found in your most holy will, for the second death will not harm them. Sobering words to ponder And I'm tempted to say, and yet, there's this other section, but it's not an and yet. It's in harmony with what was just read. It's a beautiful quote that touches exactly on what Professor Cutterback was saying. To love someone is to say, thou shalt not die. There's an excerpt from an ancient homily that's quoted in this section on Jesus' descent into death that reads as following. Today, a great silence reigns on earth. A great silence and a great stillness. A great silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh 
and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. He has gone to search for Adam, our first father, as for a lost sheep. Greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death, he has gone to free from sorrow Adam and his bonds and Eve captive with him. He who is both their God and the son of Eve, quote, I am your God who for your sake have become your son. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. To love someone is to say, thou shalt not die. Thank you for giving us that insight. Two talks that might be of interest to you for further study. Um, The first is Senecan Seminar. The title is Senecan Seminar. It was a two-part webinar on um, an introduction to the epistles of Seneca. Um, Some of you may know this, but St. Jerome said that Seneca's epistles were the one pagan writing that should be required reading for all Christians. And in that webinar, Dr. Meehan discusses an epistle that he wrote, which is on meeting death cheerfully. And that might be of interest to you. So Seneca Seminar. And then the second was a talk given by Professor Cutterback here. It's called Plato's Apology. And the subtitle is In Defense of Virtue in the Face of Death. So two things that might be stepping stones for further study. Okay, questions and answers. Who's first? Thank you very much for your words tonight. Did Thomas have anything to say? Again, I'm not a domestic scholar by any means. But when I think of my... My grandmother, the Irish saint, who I pray to and I talk to, did, did Thomas say anything about conversations with God, angels, and maybe other spirits that we, we, we know, that, that we still converse with? Right. Well, uh, great question. It always struck me when St. Thomas uses this uh, phrase about the interior life as, as a conversation with God and the angels. So first of all, it's, it, 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 it's fascinating there. There's a whole topic there to consider more about that we should be in conversation with the angels. And it's in, interestingly mentioned Jacob's ladder earlier. One way of uh, exegesis about Jacob's ladder, our Lord refers to how you shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending. And so one, one way that that's unfolded is that after that the fall had separated us from our kind of brothers, the angels, and, and the redemption brings us back into contact with them so that we should be in conversation with them. And obviously, in a very special way, our guardian angel. In a similar way, the saints are to be our friends in heaven, our heavenly friends. If they're friends, we're in conversation with them. And finally, isn't it just fitting and appropriate that the, those that have gone before in our own life that we continue that conversation with. And, okay, so we're not, we're not sure. Perhaps they're in, in, in purgatory, right? So we're praying for them. We still, there's nothing wrong with it, because since we're not sure, ask them to intercede for us at the same time that we're, that we're praying for them and, and, and have conversation with them. I, I do think that it is not uh, loopy. It's the opposite of loopy to be going about our day. This is, this is part of living in the presence can, can, does, is a son going to stop speaking to his father the day his father dies? And this, again, r- r- you know, raises that d- death is death, but it's also but a transition. So, yeah, I, I mean, so, so I can't say that St. Thomas says much very specifically about speaking with saints, but absolutely is in accord with where he is. So thank you for that. I understand the art of death from you like a painting. We start doing the painting, and that painting will end with our death. I like so, that. So we, our relation with God will start when we were born, and to learn that art to continue to be with God until death. Yes. So after death, we'd have no relation with God, that we could correct it. I'm not following right there where you said after, after 
We, you, we are, our relation has to be made with God okay, right, before okay. death. Yes, right. right, right when right. we die, we cannot right. correct it with God. We can't, we're not correct. But we, we, we live then in the relationship according to how it has been built up during our life. So the only opportunity we have with God in our lifetime. I, that is the common understanding, yes. Now, it is, it is worth noting that there is, um, there is theological discussion as to what happens at the moment of death or just prior to the moment of death and what God may do in that situation there as one dies. There's, there's, there's theological speculation about what might transpire there, what opportunity might God offer there. I don't think there's, there's not any absolute teaching of the church as regards that, but the church's understanding is, yes, we, we live according to our freedom in this life, and then under the grace of God, we achieve a certain standing, and that that is the key to then the afterlife, what we have under his grace achieved in this life. It, well, it, it, it is limited. We are limited by our death in as much as there, our time has come to an end. Our opportunity to be doing those free will meritorious acts, yes, has come to an end. That is, that is the understanding. But I like, I like the notion of a painting. I like that. And also, there's also the notion of a story. Our, our life is a story. In a sense, God is telling, but we are a free cooperator in it. And by, by keeping in mind our death, by cultivating the art of dying... We are being a good instrument in God's hands in having that story be told the way he wants it to be. Yes. What would you have to say about suffering as co-redemptive? Um, I would have to say that that's a great topic that is very rich theologically, and I'd want a theologian with more competence than me to address. <laughs> but but I mean, honestly, I, I, I would say... It is a beautiful theological teaching of the church following scripture that we can, we dare to say the words, but St. Paul says them, make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And I believe the common understanding there is that by God's grace and mercy, our suffering has truly redemptive aspects to it by Christ's grace, inviting us, offering us that opportunity, allowing us to suffer with him and in him, it can actually have, it can be meritorious, it can be redemptive. And you can, when you can look at that simply kind of on the order of grace, but the beautiful thing is, and this is what I tend to do as a philosopher, and it was more the approach I took tonight, more look at it, you can use redemptive in a more natural sense. We can see how suffering can be redemptive of a person using that in a less precisely theological sense, but just how you learn and grow, even naturally speaking, and thus it has a redemptive quality. Right? Aristotle and Socrates could have seen such a thing. But of course, Christianity goes so far beyond then, and also having this literally meritorious aspect of being redemptive with the power of Christ's blood. So you raise a fabulous issue that must be understood in relation to what we're talking about. So thank you for bringing it up. Yes. Professor, you su suggest that we converse with our loved ones as part of this three steps. Yes. Uh, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. How would we converse with somebody like Adolf Hitler? Good question. Um, I, I don't think you necessarily need to. <laughs> right? Um, you, you loving loving your enemy. I, I honestly don't think necessarily means that you're having much conversation. Conversation, in the deeper sense, is an act of friendship. And our Lord didn't say that you have to be friends with your enemies, but you do need to love them. There are those that we love that we are not, in the proper sense, friends with. So I'm not in any way taking away from the the radical and very challenging command to love our enemies. I'm in no way ma ma making light of that, but I do think that this is where I mean, a distinction needs to be made. Uh, there might not be much space there for conversation, or you might have words of mercy or words of evangelization. Uh, at, at the appropriate moment, 
when we think someone might have ears to hear, then we do say a word in a friendly spirit. Not as though they were friends, though. So it's, it's, it's different levels of conversation. Uh, you sh- can share your heart with a friend. You don't have to share your heart in that kind of way with your enemies, though we give our heart by loving them. Does that seem fair? I hope I don't, I hope I don't seem to be splitting hairs. I think there that one, one has to make that reasonable distinction. Yes? In the past, uh, the family used to be very involved with preparing uh, the body for, for burial, you know, washing, anointing, dressing. Do you think that there's value in trying to reclaim that, that Christian practice of the very hands-on preparation for a family member for burial? I, 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 I do. I just I, I am suggesting that. I, I don't want to. Um, I, I, I'm a little bit reticent to, to make it sound as though this is an absolute theological imperative that it mu- must be done. But I think that this is the kind of thing that we can see as Christians where it might not be absolutely necessary, but it's a good and beautiful thing that has spiritual repercussions. We are soul body composites. How we treat the body, how we act in the body is, uh, always has spiritual repercussions. And so I do so many cultures have those traditions that are being lost in an overly technologized, etc., and leave it, to the, leave it to the professionals. That, I think, is an area worth considering, with all due respect to the industry of burial, that certain things I think it is well worth looking at reclaiming and saying, thank you for offering to do that. We'll actually lower so-and-so into the ground. We'll do this. We'll prepare the body. Again, when possible, if particularly one has a community, I absolutely think that that's a, a, a very beautiful and fitting thing to do. Yes, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you, Professor. We'll end with this question right here. Okay. Perhaps it goes without saying, but there's all kinds of conversations to be had. Is there anything that you want to say about those conversations that might be meritorious Thank to have? You. Great. Um, Dishi von Hildebrand once said something that I very much appreciate. He said, the higher the reality, this is a paraphrase, the higher the reality you share with someone, the more that it binds you together. The higher the reality you share with someone, the more it binds you together. There's, here, this can sound like a throwaway line, but it's, and one does need to get specific, but it's our conversations should tend towards the higher things. And, and so this, again, more important and less important, as Aristotle points out, that friends like to speak about most everything. That doesn't mean that most everything is equal. There are conversations, then there are conversations. There are conversations where you really are most alive. And Pat, I, I pat you on the back. Of, of taking a Sunday evening to come out and to be willing to apply your intellect to this. This is the type of thing that fills our imaginations, our thoughts with the type of things that then we go home and we speak about. We share these things. The good conversations are getting rarer and rarer. And so to have to be thinking about and questioning these things, the more ultimate questions are the most important things to talk about and to be reading good works together, literature, scripture, to be reading it together I mean, in, in the family, among our friends, in great art. There's, there's all different kind of levels of truth density. But to be aware of each thing's in their proper place, it is, there's nothing like being united in having richer things to talk about and so to run after them. And then I, I just come back to the, to the earlier question. That's the kind of conversation you can't have with certain kind of people. That's not being judgmental. It's being realistic. And you try to cultivate the relationships where you can be most alive and be cultivating the art of dying together with those people in those conversations. That was a long answer. Thank you for a great question. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Thank you, Professor, for taking so much time with us. And I speak on behalf of everyone that we appreciate the care with which you guide us through these questions. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, 
please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.